Hi, everybody, and welcome again to our next Leadership Lessons, If I Knew Then conversation. Uh, I'm Jason Nazar, the co-founder and CEO of Comparably, and so happy to have my friend Xander Lurie, the CEO of Momentive, that many of you may know as uh, SurveyMonkey, formerly before. What's up, Xander? How you doing, Jason? Thanks for having me. I'm fantastic. And I've been looking forward to this time with you for a long time. You know, you're one of the folks that I feel like every time we get a chance to talk or interact, I just learn so much from you. So I know this is going to be a treat for so many folks. And thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is a series that we do in combination with Comparably and Entrepreneur.com, where we just have really transparent and thoughtful and vulnerable conversations with amazing CEOs of incredible companies like Momentum. Uh, for those of you that are joining us for our, you know, the 20th or 30th time, thank you for coming back. Uh, and as many of you may know, uh, this is a series that we also used to do in person in Los Angeles for many years called Startups and Censored. And among the reasons why it's so meaningful for me to have you here, Xander, is your predecessor and good friend, Dave Goldberg, um, the former CEO of Survey Monkey, who, you know, untimely passed away, who was so many of our mentor and idol and someone we looked up to was a guest with us live in Los Angeles. And so it's just amazing for us to connect the dots here after all these years. In fact, um, I had a couple people email me today who are on our email list serve saying that they were at that Dave Goldberg session all those years ago, and we're so looking forward to seeing you. And so, you know, I think for a lot of us, um, you know, we have been massive fans and proponents of SurveyMonkey. I was using that product feel like 18 years ago in business school, you know, it's been one of the iconic brands of the internet for the past really two decades now almost, um, you know, but in your own words, how do you describe momentum, momentum in your business today? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And um, I remember vividly uh, Dave's interview with you. I wasn't there in person, but I remember him speaking fondly of it. So it's a it's an honor to come back and spend time with you. And I, uh, I learned a lot from you in our conversations. You're an awesome entrepreneur. So uh, it's great to be here. So Momentum, we are an agile experience management company. Uh, we sell software to help our customers uh, deliver better experiences for their stakeholders. And we all have stakeholders. Everybody's front door is digital today, whether it's your website or your app or email. And if you're trying to deliver better experiences for your customers, for your employees, for your shareholders, for your patients, for your students, it starts with asking a question. And that's what SurveyMonkey has been incredible at for 21 years is our software sits between one human being asking another human being for her opinion. It's not behaviorally targeted. We don't triangulate on who you are. We help our customers ask the people they care about, how are we doing? How can I make that experience better? How can the curriculum deliver you a better experience? So we've built up a pretty amazing business with you know 20 million plus active users and 850,000 paying subscribers. But we have expanded significantly over the last five years into other verticals. And so we've developed other SaaS software solutions for market research, for customer experience specifically. And so SurveyMonkey is bigger, stronger than it's ever been, but it is the product as opposed to the company name going forward. And so, we found uh, over the last 14 months of research with an external agency doing customer research, talking to employees, using our own products, of course, uh, that Momentum really was about adaptive, active, this moment, something momentous. And it's a made up word. We've got to do a lot of um, storytelling with our customers to populate it and make it the rich brand we believe it has the capability to be. But Momentum is an agile experience management company. We're in multiple SaaS product categories, and we're excited to take our solutions to market. Yeah. Well, um, first off, congrats on the rebrand and all the continued success that you and your team are having. And um, we'll definitely dive into you know, the thought process behind that decision and where you're going from here. I'd love to start with your own background in your career. One of the things that to me is so fascinating is all the different paths that people take to, to get this CEO spot, and especially for you, and now this really watched public tech company, right? Because you didn't come up from the traditional path of the 20-year-old founder CEO in a garage as an engineer. You had this really incredible background in banking, and then we're at a lot of amazing organizations as their head of strategy. Um, I didn't even realize that you had been a CFO, right? I think for a little bit in your career too, or on the finance side. Um, Maybe just from a high level, I know you had been on the board, right, of SurveyMonkey with a lot of other amazing companies. 
how did those how did that those conversations transpire when you know you were first thinking about or selected to come on to Survey Monkey at the time, now Momentive? And was that a role you think that you were you were going to still be in after all these years? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a funny conversation you have with folks about for some reason the CEO title has this kind of allure that people want to understand the revisionist history of how you got there. Um, I went to law school without a great rationale. I didn't have a clear path or understand that I wanted to be a lawyer. I just kind of stayed in school. I pretty quickly realized I didn't want to be a practicing lawyer. I got into the MBA program at Emory University. So I did that JD MBA, um, got really interested in investment banking, went into investment banking, but with a very clear focus on the internet space. This was 300 years ago, um, 1999, when I started in banking and early, early onset, Yahoo, Netscape, Amazon had just gone public. And, you know, the, the guts of the internet infrastructure were being laid for other companies to build on. So I was very interested in helping internet companies raise capital and do deals. And so I did that for seven years, made a bunch of incredible relationships. You know, you remember the dot com crash. And so it was just there were a lot fewer bankers and you were able to really have substantive, meaningful conversations and help companies like Google go public in 2004. So I had this really fun run where I learned a lot about the industry. I saw incredible people building companies. And then I was eager to get on the other side. I wanted to be on a team and I wanted to get out of the kind of deal business and get onto a team. So I joined CNET Networks, one of the iconic early 90s Internet companies, um, strategy and M&A. I became the CFO and then we sold the company to CBS and I stayed with the iconic broadcast company that was kind of multimedia until 2012. Um, in 2009, Dave Goldberg, our friend, um, asked me to join the board of SurveyMonkey when they had 12 employees. So he bought wow. the company with Bain and Spectrum, this just really viral, profitable, world-class internet product. And Dave Goldberg was one of the great entrepreneurs, mentors, networked individuals, perfectly suited to help that scale to become a global product. And I got to ride shotgun and watch him grow that business until, as you said, he sadly died on May 1st, 2015. Um, by then we had 450 employees and the board asked me to step in to kind of be interim executive director while I was at GoPro. Um, and I did that for the summer, really helped the team do budgets, was a counselor to a lot of people who were dealing with incredible grief. Uh, helped lead the CEO search. We hired another CEO who started that um, three months later. And then the CEO didn't work out. And uh, the board asked me to take the job full time, which I did in January of 2016. So, you know, for folks who ask me, like, tell me about your CEO. How do I become CEO? <laughs> I don't have a great answer. I think you should start a company. Um, I'm CEO of SurveyMonkey, now Momentum, because my friend died. Um, I never set out to kind of, I want to be a CEO. Um, so whenever I, whenever I, you know, folks ask me for counsel. Um, it's hard to tell a 17 year old, you know, find your passion, do what you love. Like the, the industry that the 17 year old, when he or she is my age, it's going to be a new industry that will be started somewhere in those 30 years. And so don't necessarily get fixated on kind of find what you want to do and then go pursue that for life. Because, you know, you and I have young kids, like they would probably, we would, the whole world would be firemen and women. Um, get focused on like flexing those growth mindset muscles get interested and get curious and learn and like try new things and you know I'm, I'm a big fan of the book range which really encourages you to kind of try stuff and find match quality find things you really are interested in you are good at you enjoy doing they will take you into new rooms and through new doors and you will end up finding a great career path you don't necessarily have to write it um down in uh you know, in, in pen when you're when you're really young. But I think you become CEO either through entrepreneurship and you start something, Jason, like you've done a couple of times, or you end up thriving inside of a company whereby, you know, management finds ways to ascend you to the to that leadership role. Yeah. It was funny, you know, I did a JD MBA as well too, and kind of similar to you. I feel like I took those three extra years in law school, not because I ever had any intention to practice, but because I was biding my time trying to figure out really what big entrepreneurial thing I was going to jump into. And, you know, my last year of law school, I started an internet company before this. Um, what was it like that first? Was that doc doc? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You're two for two. Do you have any failed internet companies you started? Um, I have lots of failures yeah, okay. all along the way, but thank you. Um, the, uh, that first year that you were CEO, 
what was the biggest thing? Like, what were you most unexpected for? You had this incredible career. You had this amazing background. You were leading teams. It wasn't as if you didn't have this incredible executive experience already. But what were you most unprepared for it actually stepping into a CEO role that if you could go back to that first 90, 120 days, you wish, you know, you knew then, at, at, you know. Yeah, I mean, my my experience was unique for me. Um, I'd never been CEO before. I think I was 41. Uh, Dave had died seven years prior to me being named CEO. The business had really tipped over in a large part where we had a lot of exposure, cost exposure. We'd, we'd set out on this path of a business model that was a bit of a failed kind of endeavor. And so I started in late January and in early March, um, I stood in front of a room and, and laid off 120 people. And it wasn't the kind of thing where we could sit down and have individual conversations. And so some of those conversations happened in other offices, but the room I addressed, I think had 90 people in the room. And I, you know, many of whom I had not yet met in person. And I kind of came in there with a lot of folks who were still either grieving about Dave Goldberg's passing or upset with the company for decisions we had made since his passing. And I stood up and said, um, for many folks, I'm sorry, but today is your last day at Survey Monkey. So, you know, I, I found like you do have to make some crisp decisions. And sometimes those decisions don't wait for 180 days. You've got to make decisions now. You know, the, the leadership lesson I learned in that job is the people decisions you are making in terms of the folks who support you at the highest levels of the company, there are no more important decisions. And so, you know, if the CEO's job is first to define strategy, where are we going? Because you don't want to take 1,500 people across a desert with you to a place where there's no water and food. You've got to align against big markets where if you are successful in executing, you will, you will find great market opportunities. I know we are in a very successful category. Like there's no doubt to me that our strategy, if we execute well, is going to be success. And so then you've got to surround yourself with world-class high integrity pe people who prioritize company culture and are going to manage people with the same vigilance and care that you put into it. So for me, that first year was, was spent really thinking through who are those top people and do the people who, who I inherited, are they the right ones to take us on the next five year journey? Or do we need to you know, be generous and say goodbye and then bring in folks uh, who can embrace that new strategic vision that we had? So, you know, those are the decisions that are the most costly, the high stakes moments. You know this in your career because that's where all the leverage is. You know, I'm just one person and I only manage a certain you know, small number of people. The rest of the people, the rest of our 1500 people are managed um, throughout the, the org. And those people decisions are the most important. Yeah. In the early part of your career, um, what do you feel like was the thing that really stood out and that you did better than the folks? And I'll give a little bit of context. I always try to give, you know, anyone that works for me the advice and anyone that wants to, you know, wants to ask that focus on the thing that you do absolutely best and just let that exponentially drive your growth. Right. I always feel like somebody has like their biggest work superpower. I ask that in every interview I do. What's your work superpower? What do you do better than anything else? Obviously, you know, when you finished grad school, there was a set of skills that you had or motivation that helped you. I mean, right place, right time. But, you know, you you moved up really quickly and at a very young age, had some very meaningful responsibilities at large, iconic digital brands. That's more than just being in the right place at the right time, what did you do better than anything else, you know, in your early twenties that you were able to leverage? You said a number of the things that, that, that are important to me, Jason. First off, right place, right time is huge. <laughs> so never mistake the fact, you know, first I'm a white man of privilege. Like I, I recognize like how lucky I am to be in the position I am. And right place, right time is huge. Better lucky than good is no joke. Um, but secondly, you know, I um, I very early on, I just got very interested in the industry as it was being created and found myself really attracted to the people and leaders who had big minds and a lot of curiosity. And I wanted to be service oriented. I wanted to help them achieve their goals and their ambitions. And so you know, people often uh, will ask you, like, how did you build your network? And it just feels so kind of icky. And to me, it's just like how you spend your time is the most precious resource you have. And whether that's work time or your social time or your weekends, I just found a lot of the people that 
I wanted to spend time with, that I wanted to be helpful to, that I wanted to build long-term relationships, you know, happened to be people who were pretty good in this industry. It just attracted that entrepreneurial spirit 20 years ago when I got started professionally. So, you know, for me, I like to tell folks in our new onboarding sessions, folks starting at Momentum, I, I like to say a few things. First and foremost, get really good at what we hired you to do. We just spent a ton of money recruiting you, training you, helping you navigate the first three to six months where your contributions might be less. Get really good at what we hired you to do, whether you're in machine learning or in sales or in marketing first. Secondly, build your cross-functional networks internally, because as you scale at the company, you've got to bring folks with you. And nobody does anything really, really hard on their own. There's no designer who's like, look at the look at the new product I designed and coded and shipped and sold and serviced. Everybody has to be working on cross-functional teams if it's a big project. So building that cross-functional network, just like you do in your life. You've got folks you call for parenting advice, for career advice, for religious advice, whatever that might be. You want to do the same thing internally. And then the third thing I, I often say to folks is you've got to manage your, your career. Like your manager is super important in that mentorship and development, but you own it. You own really working with your manager on what you're interested in, when you're getting bored, what, you know, where you've got internal uh, obstacles to your success and really taking ownership of that because this isn't a nanny state where we're here to kind of, you know, put you on a path. You've got to own it. You drive it. And that really leads way for the ambitious entrepreneurial folks to, to thrive in their career. Yeah. So I ask this question every single conversation we have. If you could take a time machine back into your 20s and you could give that Xander any professional advice, what would it be and why? You know, I, I think I give this advice to folks internally. Um, I saw a woman posted yesterday on Twitter. She started a company and then a very wealthy venture capitalist told her, uh, if he could, if he could pay twenty million dollars for one year in his twenties back, he would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> so we all idolize the who we were in our twenties. And for me, I always like to tell folks. I, I, I try to uh, echo Warren Buffett's um, line about compound growth is the eighth wonder of the world. And I don't think you appreciate it until you get old like me. The power of compounding and the that geometric kind of growth and it's not just for like wealth it is for your most important relationships and it is for your growth mindset and what skills you're learning and it is for your travel experiences and your philanthropic endeavors like what you start doing at 22 and you care about is so much bigger when you're 47 like i am than if you just kind of blow it off or you you know, you don't treat it with the same level of respect. And just, you know, I, I always used to say about Dave Goldberg, he lived, a, he, he lived a purposeful life. Everything he did, whether it was his, his wife and kids or his job at Serving Monkey or playing poker, he put his all into. And, he, you know, what you, what you measure is what matters and what you, what you feed is what grows. And whatever metaphor you want to use, that compound growth, in everything you do, I think if you can appreciate that in your 20s and you can start to see the fruits of it, you reap the benefits of it when you're in your 40s and 50s. Yeah, I love that so much. We, we talk a lot about on our team, just get 1% better a day. Just don't let a day go by in your professional life where you just do everything the same way you did before and you're going to pick your head up in a couple months and you're going to be this dramatically improved professional. So same That's time... Good. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great, yeah. I mean, that that's a hard bar to live up to 1% a day, you know, fast forward 90 days and uh, you've gotten a lot better. I mean, to, to your point though, um, you know, I, another thing about these jobs, and I know you, you, you have the same job I do, which is there, you can't be a hero in a day. There's very rarely a day where I can be this incredible hero and make some incredible call that nobody on my team saw. My team is, almost always smarter than me about any particular area and they're as smart as me in general. So it's very rare that I'm going to see something so clearly that they don't see and make some heroic call. What you have to do in these jobs when you manage a lot of people, you have to be good every day. You don't have to be a superhero, but you got to show up and bring your A game every day in terms of how you manage people, in terms of how you talk to your customers, in terms of how you do product reviews or evaluating sales prospects. 
Because when you don't, when you really just mail it in for a day, you really turn people off. You, you turn off a customer, you let an employee know that you don't really care as much about what he or she is working on. You just, that level of sloppiness can compound and really hurt you. Yeah. Very well. I mean, you got, you gave me the chills right now. I'm like, all right, I got to make sure I'm not mentally taking a day off ever. I don't, I don't do it well every day either. It's, and I know those days I go to bed knowing like that was a C plus effort. And you know, the better your team is, the more likely they will to tell you, Hey Jay, you dropped the ball. That was not yeah. the effort we needed there. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll share a quick story to the point that you just brought up that I learned the hard way. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've had lots of failures. Luckily, so far, the companies that I've been co-founders in, you know, have all, you know, had been done well or are going well. Yeah, you uh, picked great. You picked great co-founders. See, that's, you know, being great at picking co-founders is super important. It, it really is. But, you know, I really think the I was just having the conversation with our team today. I think that the single most important thing you can do in a business as a leader or a manager especially when you're in a fast growth curve is just who you pick for the team. And then the kind of experience that you give them early on, because if you get that right, so many other things afterwards can get messed up and it's going to get figured out. Whereas if you pick the wrong person, you know, but even for me to the point that you said, I started an internet company when I was uh, 26 years old, you know, we raised some money and outside of the company, everybody thought I was the most energetic, charismatic, happy, engaging person. And inside the company, they're like, wow, you're serious and you're way too intense all the time. And we hardly ever see you smile. And what I realized it took me way too long is I saved the best parts of myself for everything outside the company. And all my stress and frustration about the things that we weren't doing well showed up when I walked into the office every day. Yeah. And I wasn't that person that you just described. And I, I made a pact with myself, you know, when I got a second chance to co-found and start a company of my own in the internet space and basically said, I'm never going to show up to the office where I don't have a smile. My first thought is, what can I do to give energy to everybody else in the team? And no matter what's going on in our business and what's going on in my life, that's the person I'm going to choose to be. And I think one of the things that leaders do miss to your point is, you can't make it about you. You have to make it about everybody else and what their needs and wants are. And if you can do that and you can do it consistently, then I think people will trust you when you say, hey, this is the, the direction we should go in or here's what I'm thinking about so-and-so. You know, that hey, it's the, that's the great lesson of being an entrepreneur a couple of times. I mean, you get into this role and you realize the most rewarding part of my job and your job, I'm sure, is just seeing your teams thrive and see them do the very best work of their lives. And there's nothing uglier than the guy who's kind of running in front of the parade with the flag, you know, look at me, look at me, look what I did. But when you can deliver the kinds of resources or ideas or camaraderie your, to your team to see them all thrive, it's just, these jobs are so fun. Same time as seeing, same question. If you could take it back into your thirties, what either professional or personal advice would you give the 30 year old version of Xander and why? I think the business advice I would give myself in the thirties, I think we've just come through this incredible decade, 2010 to 2020 in our space and SaaS and cloud and e-commerce. The world is moving digitally. I mean, Satya Nadella from Microsoft said this better than anybody. You know, we, we've seen five years of, of transformation in the last few months. And there is no way that any business, and when I say business, I mean nonprofit, educational institution, services, telehealth, you name it. it, it starts at the front door of your website or your app. And so for me, it's like, I think we all underestimate how big these opportunities can be. It, it just, it hurts your mind to think how big AWS, you know, could be. And when you see something that's working and you see that you've got the right cocktail to help customers with the right product and right delivery, you, you've got to like, train yourself to not think about all the scar tissue from failed exercises or, you know, TAM and, and think this could be, there are 8 billion people on this planet. And if we do this right, this could be a massive, massive market. So I think for me in our thirties, the advice I would give myself is stop, stop undercutting the power of some of these products and some of these markets. 
and start to recognize that do, done well, there are no limitations for how big this can be and really enable people to go for it. And I'm constantly looking for our team to come like, show me how we just blow the doors off these estimates. How could you spend money hiring people, building stuff, marketing, so that we can blow away these estimates, not by percentages, but by multiples. Yeah. One of the things that was always so distinguishing to me about SurveyMonkey early on, and, and you spoke to it, was how incredibly organically and virally it grew really for the first, I think, five or 10 years of the company. It was insane. Now, partly you have the advantage of that it's built into the product experience. Every time you send a survey, you're marketing it to new people. I mean, I remember the first time in business school in 2003, we were like, hey, we have to put together a survey for something. And somebody sent the survey monkey and it's such a catchy name. You never forgot it. And it was such a great, easy to use product experience. You know, but you talked about the company was wildly profitable with 12 folks, you know, all those years ago when it first got acquired. And you had in it the DNA, just this product that massively took off without a single dollar of marketing. What, as you think about taking something that works so well, but then you have to create other markets like an enterprise or new product lines. And then eventually you do need to try to find, you know, other channels to drive distribution, whether it's, you know, any traditional marketing or online digital media. Like, how did you think about that transition of the business going from this thing that worked incredibly well, but to the last point you made, hey, let's not put any limits on what this company can be and how do we get it to the next level? Yeah, I mean, you said it, Jason, the, the parts of our growth for the first 15 years, first and foremost, it was an inherently viable product. You send a survey monkey survey to other human beings who then get exposure. And the thing you said, which resonated, you know, is everybody in any field of work needs to collect feedback. You need to serve your stakeholders. It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what level. So we knew that there was a market opportunity for everybody who is on the internet, which is the vast majority of the population in the work world today and in every industry. So that product continues to grow via this viral um, growth loop. And you just, we make the product more intuitive and more valuable for our customers every day. And so that product led growth is core, that is a core principle to the SurveyMonkey growth story. But in the process, we also created this incredible footprint across 350,000 different domains or organizations where we have tens, hundreds, often thousands of users. And so we knew that to be in the enterprise software business, we needed to up our game in a significant and new way. And so in 2016, when we really set out on this enterprise path, we didn't have engineers who were familiar with building the kinds of organizational standards, security permissions, controls, integrations that CIOs and CMOs were accustomed to buying. So we, we changed our workforce in a dramatic way in terms of the kind of folks we were hiring, the terms of product they were building, stand, legal, legal standards, how we went to market, and then building a sales force, which we really didn't have. And that's the kind of jump where we needed to be bold. It's very expensive, but we knew it would take us up market and create a whole new market opportunity for us. And so once we did that, we then set out and said, what kinds of use cases are people using SurveyMonkey for? The number one was help me do better by my customers. And that led us into the customer experience market. So that was really that purpose built CX solution. We made a couple of acquisitions, a lot of organic growth, and that led us to the get feedback product solution we have today. And then market research was really about using SurveyMonkey to ask a certain cohort questions that you didn't have access to. And so if comparably wanted to reach the HR community and you knew your ideal buyer was this gender, ethnicity, demo, age, income bracket, but you didn't have his or her emails, you would come to SurveyMonkey because we had this massive panel of users every day. And so that then led us into market research. And that, those have been the two big expansion charters we've had CX and market research, all up market selling to enterprise buyers. Yeah. You know, obviously we're a business that a lot of what we do is, you know, is unlocked with the survey product as well too. We've had on, you know, as a guest before Ryan from Qual Qualtrics and Leslie from Medallia. As you think about, you know, this space has really become really hot over the last five to seven years where there's been a ton of venture capital and public company investment going into insights from your customers, from your employees, from any key stakeholder. How do you think about, you know, staying ahead of the product curve of what everyone else is doing? Obviously, you know, from your roots at SurveyMonkey, you were the market leader. Everyone was looking to you for all those years, even though it wasn't to start an enterprise product. You know, how do you feel like 
your team leads that product vision to build something that's just new and different than you know the solutions that exist in market. You know, it's it's such a fun time in our industry because if you think about it, all the best businesses that the patent is no longer what it was when you were back in law school. It, it, that does not protect your business where a smart team develops a patent, gets it approved, you get some long you know number for your patent, then all of a sudden you've got a 17 year run to sell your product at at premium prices and enjoy uncompetitive profits. Those days are over. You know, we have a legal group, we have a, a healthy set of patents, but they don't protect us from bad customer experiences. They don't protect us from bad sales execution. If we don't put great product out in the market every day, we're gonna lose. So our teams work cross-functionally to make sure we're listening well to our customers, to our sales teams, making our own prognostications about the market as we think about that product roadmap and how to deliver world-class product for our customers. So that is a core component to, and I think it's what's fun about the industry is, as you said, the market is awash in capital. I mean, there has never been more VC money in private equity. I think we just eclipsed 800 unicorns. You know, the SPAC market raised $100 billion in Q1. Nobody knew what SPAC stood for a year ago. So there, the market is awash in capital and there is a dearth of good ideas. So it's all about getting the right capital to the right entrepreneurs you know, so they can continue to develop. And we feel that pressure every day. We know that Medallia and Qualtrics are gunning for us. We know there's a whole new class of, you know, Y Combinator backed startups that want a piece of this market. And we just know that if we deliver great product and charge our customers less than the value they're getting, they're going to drive and keep spending with us and drive that net revenue retention. So we, we feel the heat every day, but we have fun doing it. We want to service our customers and deliver them great products. So it's a challenge. We feel like we have a, a good shot of living up to yeah, I love that. On a quick side note, you made me laugh because, you know, like you, I do a little bit of angel investing. And anytime a founder comes to me and says, oh, well, we got a patent on this. If it's not genetics or like the, a right. flying car, I'm like, count me out. If you're thinking about your business competitive advantage being a, a patent, you're just a couple steps behind where the world's been for a while. It's very challenging to, to patent a certain you know, software design engineering process or business process for how you service customers. And, you know, look at the space market, look at the COVID vaccine market, look at the, you know, autonomous vehicles and EV market. It, everything should be competitive. That's good for customers. It's good for the industries. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question that I think applies to a lot of folks. And I'll tell you very candidly, um, is going to be a bit of like coaching and therapy for me. Because I think one of the transitions that a lot of us go through is, you know, early on when you are a founder, uh, people make a bet on you really in large part because of all these things you've been able to do, right? Like you, you got this product market fit. You were able to accomplish a lot as a founder with a, not a lot of resources. And over time, as you grow and mature into a CEO and certainly a CEO of a company at your stage and size, you know, Mike Jones from Science told me some of the best advice ever guy he said, your job as CEO, Jason, is not to do any work. I thought, man, you're crazy. What are you talking about? You know, and I, I really come to realize like, hey, that's where it creates the bottleneck. But to me, there's always this tension as you're trying to get to the next stage that there are things you feel like as a leader you can do to help drive the bus versus be, you know, at the back of the crowd coaching and cheerleading. And I wonder how, after all these years, you balance this, because I'm sure there's things that you know you just can execute extremely well, extremely fast. And it's probably frustrating for you when you feel like things are going too slow. And how do you know when to grab the reins and to drive to the next key point versus when to just keep empowering people to figure it out on their own? I mean, that's a that's a huge question. We could You could probably write a book on. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer for it. I'll say... There's, there's four areas where I feel like I need to be out in front and showing folks how much I care. The first we, we chat about briefly is corporate strategy. And that doesn't change every three months, but every year we have a pretty rigorous strategic planning process where we, we define what are we trying to do for the next three years? What area are we trying to go? And we're gonna put a bunch of bets. We're gonna hire people. We're gonna put our reputation at stake. I'm gonna put my personal reputation at stake. And that corporate strategy is something that is fluid because the world is very dynamic and our competitive set is dynamic and our customers needs change. So I think corporate strategy is one the CEO needs to be quite involved in. Two I mentioned before is recruiting. Like I spend a ton of time recruiting. 
you know, we send surveys and you have a drop down menu that asks which which function you're in. There's no function that says CEO. And so among the choice, I always put HR. It's the area where I feel like if I crush it in HR, if I just do better than anybody else in being a world class HR leader, we'll do we'll do really well. The third is a hard one for you and for me and everybody else, which is driving accountability. And you cannot get paid enough or get promoted out of holding folks accountable for delivering excellence. And so as you think about setting your OKRs, your objectives and key results, as you think about setting your board targets for revenue or EBIT or free cash flow, as you think about your standards for diversity, equity, and inclusion you post with your board, you've got to hold yourself and your team accountable. And you know it when they fall short or when you, when you fall short. And so I really try and prioritize raising my hand when I let the team know I didn't deliver for you. This is what I set out to do. This is what I did. This is what I missed. This is where I didn't put in enough effort. And I'm sorry for that. But you also have to do that with your CFO and your head of HR and your head of comms and your general counsel. And they need that. They need that coaching. They need to stay sharp and they need the CEO's, you know, accountability. And then lastly is comms. It's just being super consistent about what you're saying to whom, how frequently, because when you have 1,500 employees and 850,000 customers and a whole bunch of shareholders you talk to every 90 days, you've got to be really consistent about what your strategic vision is, what you're trying to do, and recognize that people don't get it on the first, second, or 12th time. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, it's part of what makes the job really rigorous and fun is the, all the challenges. You know, Juneteenth got passed yes, last Thursday morning. How do you respond to that in terms of thinking about what the Friday workday looks like and what the impact it has on your, your teams and their priorities? Um, but you got to stay vigilant and you got to have a ton of energy for this job. And the moment you're like, oh, I can't do that or I'm, this is really getting hard, it's probably ready for somebody else to take the baton. Yeah. I'd love to dive in and talk about how you see the future of work uh, as far as hybrid in office. And, and again, I'll share, you know, really, quite frankly, what I'm just struggling with, which is that I think everyone's lives you know, for the most part has gotten better by having more flexibility in terms of the hours that they needed to be at the office. I don't know anyone that says, I'm not, you know, more thankful for the fact that I have more time for with my family, more time for, you know, personal matters. In many ways, I'm more productive. You know, if you live in Los Angeles and you're not dealing with a two hour commute daily, that's a game changer. On the other hand, having built companies for 20 years now, where there was a group of us that were in a room for 12 hours a day. There's a certain magic that happens in the white space. In that period of time where you're not necessarily trying to solve anything, but just where the imagination is just unleashed. And I also see that I think a lot of folks, especially that don't have families and are in cramped spaces, are dealing with a lot of mental health issues and loneliness uh, that I've never seen. And, and we all know that there is this impending exodus that employees are taught that have been reported in the news of if folks are being asked to return to the same traditional workforce. And so I think things are going to change certainly for the next you know couple of years. And I'm curious to get from your point of view, what do you think are the, is the model that's going to be best for individuals and best for companies? And as you keep saying, still best for customers, because at the end of the day, it's about, you know, at work, delivering products and services and experiences that are meaningful for the people that put their hard-earned, you know, money into the things that we're trying to create. Yeah, I mean, this, it's a rough transition for us old guys as we think about kind of how it used to work well. Um, it's been, a, you know, COVID has been super challenging for millions and millions of people who don't have the same privileges we have of working in offices and where we've had all this autonomy. But for those of us who work in tech and privileged to work in these, you know, white collar jobs, technology jobs, engineering, sales, et cetera, um, you know, a couple of things stand out. First, as you said, option value is critical. Everybody wants option value in their life. Nobody wants to be told you have to be in the office 830 to 530 Monday through Friday. And so, you know, getting out of that daily grind of the commute is a, is a big win for folks. Secondly, you know, I think that in general, in a hybrid workplace, you will need to give folks a prescriptive reason why to come to the office as opposed to why not to be in the office. And I think that's the default is we are going to go, we are moving more towards a world where managers have to be very clear and planful 
about why we're coming together for hackathons, for engineering teams, or for design sessions, or strategy sessions, or for sales trainings, or maybe it's just for fun and for networking and for folks to get together and, and chat and have those opportunities for design, you know, strategy sessions, brainstorming sessions. But the days of like hitting the daily commute to come to do email and to sit into a room with folks on Zoom in a really poor process that's not inclusive, those days are over. And the companies that get it wrong will see key talent flee. And the companies that get it right will be a, you know, a, a hive for kind of the best engineers and sales folks to, to be attracted to. So we're, you know, we send a lot of surveys around return to work. People use our product probably more than any other platform in the world. So we've seen just the, the voracious interest and appetite there is in getting this right. And I'm encouraged by how companies are leaning forward. And if we've learned anything over the last 15 months, it's that we can trust our teams. They're not only resilient, but they're working really hard. You can measure that in lines of code that are being shipped, sales calls that are being made, and just delivery, the productivity and financial performance of us and our peer set has been really impressive. So I think folks are gonna get this right, but it starts with trust of your employees and giving folks autonomy to work where they work well, and then be be strategic and, and creative about how you bring folks together to get the best of that yesteryear in this new world order. Yeah. There's a larger societal point that I think about, and I'm going to bring it up in a moment. But the first thing I want to do is like recognize, honestly, a lot I learned from you. I think a lot of us who have had some measure of success um, really wish that we spend even more time, not just money, but time like giving back. And, you know, you've got this incredible charity coach art that you started and you did it when you were really young. And to me, that was what was so special and rare is that you didn't wait until like, oh, I'm you know, exactly where I want to be at financially. I don't have any worries. Like you really made it a big deal to make giving back a, a huge part of who you were and who your family was like very early on. So I want to recognize you for that because a lot Thank of people you. may not know that. Um, to me, I think one thing that I think a lot about is that one of the defining issues of our age is income inequality. And I know you feel the same. And there's just, it's not been a fair deal over the past many years of what the divide between the haves and have nots, you know, if you're an Amazon driver, if you work in retail, if you work in a restaurant, no one tells you, oh, just do your best work wherever that is. And so are we creating this divide now where there's a class of citizens that have to be at somewhere eight, nine, 10 hours a day to get by? And then there's another class of citizens that not only already get paid more because they're more educated and advanced more in their career, but have all these flexibilities. And that's not to say that folks shouldn't have those flexibilities. I just wonder how this is going to play out over time and how it, it might compound an already major issue of income inequality that we have to turn back and try to fix. I mean, income equality has been playing out for 40 years. It's a major, major problem of our time. And for folks that don't see this, they've just got their head in the sand. And, you know, it, you see it manifest in, in locations, in education, in in ethnicity and i think it's incumbent upon corporate leaders you know for you and i who have we have a platform we have a voice we have capital we have a supportive board we don't need to overcome a filibuster to pass laws we don't need to have we we need to be we need to put our resources to work to make society more equitable because it's good for our business there is no i have no patience for folks that want to negotiate or argue about is diversity important to the health of your business if you run a scaled business with a lot of customers and a lot of employees it is it's non-negotiable so what are you as ceo doing to make your company part of the solution and getting on that path to progress is critical and you're seeing it play out on social media you're seeing it play out in politics if we are not getting more vigilant about education opportunities employment opportunities pay equity for women and people of color we're just we're just putting our head in the sand and we've got to be more vigilant about this because it's the, the consequences will be dire. All right. So last question for today, and I hope we get a chance to do this again in, in, in shorter period of time than a couple of years, because I've got 101 questions. I, I'd love to still pick your brain on uh, 10 years from today. What does momentum look like? What is that business? And what are you most excited about building with your team into that future? Yeah, I mean, that's the path we're on is really thinking about what are the experiences that organizations want to deliver for their stakeholders, for their customers over the long term. And part of the reason these businesses are so 
richly rewarded by investors is because of the LTVs, the long-term value of these solutions. Customers, once they start using your products, they integrate them with their workflows and they just become more and more integral to the experiences they deliver for their customers. And so we know that AI is gonna be critical. And I like to talk about AI, not with artificial intelligence because nobody likes artificial sweeteners or surgeries. It's about adaptive intelligence, authentic intelligence, agile intelligence. How can we make our customers use software in a way that is more focused on the human being they're trying to serve? So you're seeing us do this with our mobile products, with our products that integrate with Salesforce, our Zoom integration, market research, CX. And I, I just think this is a massive global market. There's nothing inherently US or North American about it, but it necessitates more product delivery, better machine learning products, better marketing, better sales. And I, I still think we're in the very early innings of this business. So if we execute well, I, I hope Momentum will be here for many years to come and we can come celebrate uh, at our 10th anniversary with you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, well, Xander, every time I talk to you, I feel like I'm smarter <laughs> and a better person for it. You should so, hang out with smarter people then. No. Uh, the one thing I will say, too, is I know uh, you you know work in the Bay Area and probably all over the world now, but I think your heart is still here in Los Angeles with ah. sport teams. So, you know, um, hopefully, uh, you know, you're going to spend more time where your heart is as well, too. For everyone that was here joining us today. You know, thank you. I think you can see, you know, Xander has just been such an amazing, generous person with his time and what you've done in your career. The, you know, Survey Monkey has a long, incredible history. And I think for them to be able to continue on their lineage and build momentum with you at the helm is really exciting. And a lot of us are learning from you and your teams and the products that you're building and how you're helping so many folks. So thank you so much again for your time today. No, thank you for having me and thanks for the uh, two generous words. Uh, it's, it's an honor to speak with you and talk to your audience. And I wish you and your family and your, uh, your company a ton of uh, good luck in the future. Take care, my friend. Thank you. And thank you everyone again for joining us. We're going to continue to have more amazing guests like Sanders. So we'll see you for the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Take care.